On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, it's British chocolate versus American chocolate. Welcome to Kilts and Culture, boys and girls. The Today, we have a special treat. Um, not many people, or I don't know, many people may know. I don't know if many people know. In our audience? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. perhaps. Um, British chocolate is kind of has a different taste than American chocolate. A lot of people think that British chocolate is better or not as good or whatever. Um, so we thought it would be kind of interesting. Today we're actually going to test a few different candy bars from the UK and then a couple from the US that are as similar as we could find them so that we're testing something that's kind of similar and then kind of give our thoughts on the uh, the consistency of the chocolate and how which is better or worse. Make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. I am a chocolate expert. I've been studying it since I was three or four. So... I think Very I can good. do this. I think I can handle this. So, first two up. We are doing penguins and Twix. So, I know nothing about penguins, uh, but outside Mac, of, you know, you are, small you are birds. You're a cho chocolateer. <clears throat> well, the, uh, the penguin brand was uh, first produced in 1932 by William McDonald, um, a manufacturer in Glasgow. Um, oh, cool. So, this is actually Scottish. Yes, this is Even actually Scottish. Okay. Yep. So the um, they ended up merging with another uh, couple, another company, um, but each wrapper has a funny joke or fact printed on uh, printed uh, on the inside. Uh -oh. So that okay. may be there. Okay. What's a penguin's favorite film? Frozen. <laughs> All right, I want to try one. All right. Yeah. No, I can't do the same one you just said. All right. I did. Um, Mac. Adam? Are they all about penguins? Yes, Every single. Yes, yeah. How many candy bars can you produce with different penguin jokes? Well, there's. Apparently, hold on, Adam. They had an advertising program, which is on the, the main well. wrapper nope, there, which okay. is puh, 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 pick a penguin. Puh, 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 pick a penguin. Puh, puh, puh. puh. Right. Okay. All right. My joke so, is. Uh, yeah, do you mind? Uh, why was the penguin's head so cold? Because he was wearing an ice cap. <laughs> <laughs> oh. My son would love it. Glaswegian humor. Okay. Which we we're gonna, so we're gonna do Twix and penguins. Yeah. Um, I, worth noting, I went with the Twix because I this this uh, the penguin bars have kind of a biscuit cookie in them. That was the only thing I could find, you know, locally punch. that was yeah. that had a cookie in it. So okay. Should we do penguin first? Sure. Okay. You guys ready? So Mac and Adam, everyone out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Slancha. Slancha. <laughs> Are the mics picking up all this? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes they are. <laughs> Enjoy, everyone. Um, okay. Hmm. Let's just do one bite, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Okay. What are your thoughts? It tastes stale. <laughs> Traveled all the way from <laughs> Scotland. It. Um, no offense, but um, okay. It's got it's got a chocolate cream kind of a fill, but it's very very stiff. It's not like gooey. It's like a, like yeah. a hardened cream, and the biscuit portion reminds me of biscuits I've had on an airplane. I can't, yeah. I can't honestly say the chocolate on the outside is okay, but I can't really say I'm impressed with the well, flavor very much. To kind of go back to uh, talking about them uh, briefly, they also are used more for dipping in tea. I was about to say this feels so, like it should be like with coffee or tea. So yeah. there's also yeah, another it's a brand. Tea there's also another brand called Tim Tam, which is an Australian brand. Okay, um, it's a very close competitor to this. They have a little. Little spats they go back and forth, little, um, <laughs> little, you know, little fun little uh, back and forth battle. Between friendly the two or not companies. so friendly competition. Huh? But that, it seems like majority of people do like the penguins over the Tim Tams. It definitely seems like a tea, like a tea biscuit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes more sense now. All right. Okay, well, let's try the Twix. And yeah, it's gonna be. I will let you pick up your own Twix. Right, thanks. That's Twix. Yep. It's the, I, to I could have told you that. <laughs> the I don't really taste that much of a difference between the chocolates. Hmm. Like the the you you're you're on the money with the the the, the tea and biscuity kind of the flavor of the, the flavor yeah. of the biscuit. 
Yeah, but I, I don't taste a lot, of, like a, a completely different chocolate profile for the Twix versus the Penguins. Yeah, good point. Let's try it. I'm just gonna try just mm -hmm. to nibble the edge. Yeah, there's almost no difference at all. They taste like chocolate coating chocolate. Yeah. Which is not the same as like if you're getting a whole chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just very, very sweet and a very light milk chocolate flavor. I'm not. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe the, the 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 British one like has a little bit more of a film on my mouth, maybe. It's not but it's not like That's any, appetizing. Like, it's not well <laughs> like the suet from the from the haggis video. Um, it's not any more like ch like savory or milk chocolatey or like, I don't know. Mm. All right, well, let's try the-, the... I do, This would be good with tea. It really does feel like mm -hmm. a, just a chocolate colored, covered tea biscuit. Let's try Milky Way and Mars Bar. Okay, now you found out something about this one too, right, Mac? Yeah, so the Mars Bar was also manufactured, at first manufactured in 1932 as well, in England. Um, and it was to resemble, it was made to resemble the American Milky Way. So this is basically a Milky Way knockoff. Yeah. But it's, wait, it's the same candy company? They uh, did eventually did get bought up by the Mars uh, company, yes, both of them. Oh, so it started off as a knockoff by a different company. So is yes. it just like a different wrapper? It's, I'm looking down, down, looking down the barrel of, of a Mars bar. The, uh, looking down the barrel of a Milky the, Way. The, uh, the, the section, if you look at it, you know, cut right through, literally it looks effectively the same. Mm. Um, it's, you know, chocolate and uh, uh, nougat on the bottom and caramel above the, mm -hmm. above the nougat. Um, these guys have theirs? Yeah, that's it's, okay. You got you, okay. I'm noticing the same thing. The other thing I'm noticing is the is the Milky Way is wider. Like you get, yeah, a little yeah, bit. I think it's, it's a little, little bit wider. Bit it's and it's Americans a, are fatter. You know we what need I think? More, we need what? more candy. <laughs> that's right. It's possible there's to make a little bit more air in the Milky Way. Maybe it's more yeah. uniform. All right, we'll but start I off with which. Start off with Mars. Let's okay. try that. Is there a life on Mars? I don't even need to try the other one. It's a freaking Milky Way, Milky Way bar. I don't like microwaves, so <laughs> this is not very good for me. We're gonna be answering questions super fast today. As soon as we, uh, <laughs> I'm also gonna be doing my uh, my insulin shot after this. <laughs> right, so Mars. Taste like candy bar. What do you think? I think they, they taste the same, but I think the Milky Way is stiffer, has more more, has more, more density to it than, mm -hmm. than the, the Mars bar. And it's the caramel, lighter. at least on mine, the caramel came out was, was a nicer consistency. Yeah. Agreed. The Milky Way. That could be a transportation thing, though. I don't know. Yeah, the Mars bar was definitely squishier. <sighs> Sugar. And it kind of... Uh, the the caramel got stuck everywhere. Um, Milky Way, it was it was definitely denser. Mm -hmm. But it, it, as far as the chocolate itself, again, I don't see much of a delta. And I would like to redo this experiment with some uh, Cadbury um, products. Products, fair, fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. fair. Yeah, I think I think what this tells me is that it's not so much the the uh, the companies. As it is the, or it isn't so much the nationality; it's the individual chocolatiers. Because I mean, we, we've we've said before that you know Britain has a reputation of, ha of having better quality chocolate mm -hmm. than the U.S. At the moment, I'm not detecting much difference between these, except of course that the the penguin has a different flavor profile because it's a it's a biscuit, you know, so it's a culturally significant flavor mm -hmm. with the biscuit because you know in the states not many people eat tea biscuits. Um, I really want coffee now. No, no, thank you. Not that badly. No, I wasn't offering. I'm just making fun of you because yeah, I have yeah, some. Yeah. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. No, something. Now I'm going to try this with coffee. There we go. There, see, I, I bet that's going to be better. It's, though. This is I a failure. I, I, I thought we were going to actually have some kind of discernible, different <laughs> taste. So at least I'm going to try to give you something, guys. I don't know. I, I like the Mars bar over the Milky Way. If you I do? was to pick okay. two, a bit between those two, I would it's definitely subtle, take though. the. I don't think it's. 
I it to me it just it tastes it's lighter. It's, it's, it's a little bit lighter. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll buy uh, that. I don't know calorie count or anything like that. I tend to prefer would be different. Who cares? <laughs> it's true. Really? I mean, Adam, do you have any opinions? It's a candy bar. Um, I'm with I'm with Mac in that I like the uh, I like the Mars bar better. Um, yeah, I, I just I like the texture better on the Mars bar uh, than I did on uh, the Milky Way. That being said, I think I'm going to need to visit a dentist after today. <laughs> yeah. We should have brought toothbrushes. We could have tried some oh my Scottish gosh. toothpaste, maybe. <laughs> there you go. So I'm going to need that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the penguin is growing on me. I like the... But I like, yeah. I, I prefer cookies or something or nuts with chocolate. I agree. Chocolate, I agree. So. I'm not a big, like, sweet tooth guy. I don't, yeah. you know, have that hankering for a candy bar now and again. Um, cookies or something with a bit of a, mm -hmm. a crunch. Well, speaking of that, considering the uh, next month will be St. David's Day. Would you be willing to consider possibly doing a Welsh food for our It'll actually be three days after St. David's Day, because I'm not going to be here. I'm not picky. Um, sure. What should we eat from Wales? Well, we could do short. We could do, um, we could do, uh, um, Welsh cookies, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Welsh cookie yeah. company. Yeah. 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 Um, the Welsh have their own version of a pasty, so unless you want to do a Cornish... Yeah, Cornwall kind of a celebration it's a at some point. Pasty. <laughs> they're they're very similar, if not yeah, identical. Yeah. But well, it's they're not that far apart. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, geographically. Yeah. yeah. So the coal mines are a little further apart, but you know, it's the same goal: having something to carry in the coal mine. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it'll also be St. Patrick's Day season, so we might want to do some Irish tries. But um, okay, open the suggestions on that as always. Yeah. Right? If you guys have any suggestions of Welsh stuff we should ingest, um, <laughs> <laughs> let us know. Doesn't have to be food; it could be Welsh. Welsh whiskey, Welsh, other types of Welsh alcohol. We like drinking on the show. So, whatever you got, throw it at us. <laughs> Not literally, please. <laughs> um, yeah, um, while we're being seasonal, I will uh, say since it happens to be uh, St. Bridget's Day in bulk, I will say happy St. Bridget's Day and happy in bulk to anybody who is celebrating today. So, good on you. All right. All right. With that being said, guys, load in the questions. If you have any questions about... Uh, Highland wear or kilts or anything that you want us to answer, let us know. Load them in the comments, and Eric and I, your honored hosts, will be happy to wax poetic. Um, would you like me to start with one now? Sure. Okay. Um, we do have a few preloaded questions now and a few backlog questions. We're going to try and get some more of them this time. First one I was curious about personally, so I wanted to hear you answer, was uh, how often do you travel in your kilt, and how do you handle airport security? <clears throat> Have you ever been patted down in a kilt? I, I make them kiss me first. It's the <laughs> the uh, uh, every time I have traveled in a kilt, um, my wife hates it because generally you get stopped. Um, a traditional kilt, meaning a kilt with straps and buckles. Um, the buckles will set off the alarm. You cannot take them off the side of the kilt, so we will always be pulled to the side, or at least I will, and then she is forced to wait for me. Um, and then you get the old wand, and you know you have to stand on the feet print and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So it's it will take a little bit of extra time. Generally, the people are pretty cool about it, um, and the the reaction of the TSA is for the most part, you know, excited or happy to see a guy in a kilt, or you know, I can't believe you're flying in a kilt, kind of thing but they will still stop you because you still have metal that you can't take off. Right, right. But you haven't. Do you, you don't feel like you've been singled out for weird treatment because of wearing a kilt? No. If anything, they're just amused because it's a break in their routine. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, what about comfort in a kilt in an airplane or other confined space for a long period of time <coughs> when you're traveling versus you know, wearing shorts or pajamas or something? If it, if it was a long flight, like all the way over to the UK or to China or whatever, um, Slight difference there, I will put well, out, but... Well, anything over like two hours, right, three hours. Right. If okay. you have to sit in it for a long time, um, because the seats, I'll, I'll go this way, because the seats are generally cloth, mm -hmm. um, they kind of grab the material. So if you move around at all, you're going to end up with like a bulky spot underneath you. Okay. Um, and you have to be able to, you know, in the contortionist seats that they give you, get into your aisle, past the other people if there's anyone sitting there, you know, get into the seat, bend down, swoop the pleats, and sit back in your seat, all in a, you know, foot and a half cubic space that they allot you now. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, 
I don't do it often, or I haven't done it often, um, mostly for shorter flights, mm -hmm. or um, like we had to fly out to Chicago. I had to fly out to Chicago to measure a pipe band for jackets. Um, so I wore it then because that's what I was going to be wearing for the day and flying back that night. Okay. Um, that being said, I don't do it often. Okay. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Um, I, I always go for an aisle seat anyway, but I would absolutely make sure I had an aisle seat if I was kilted. Any, any times I've ever flown, I'd made sure I was in an aisle seat, so you just have a little extra room to, to do the pleat sweep if you want to. Um, and I obviously, since I have more than one kilt, I'm not wearing my only kilt or my best kilt on the airplane. It's more likely like a utility kilt or one of my PV kilts, something that is travel okay. You know, if, if something weird happens to it or something, you know, it doesn't matter. Or if it gets wrinkled, you know, but, but the good kilt stays in the luggage until I get to where I'm going, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. The one extra, one other thing to think about is if you are wearing a kilt, kilt, are they going to consider, is the air, uh, is the airline going to consider your sporin, your carry-on bag? If that's hmm. the case, like hmm. you're allowed, like what, a briefcase and a, a physical carry-on. So, and a woman's allowed a purse and a carry-on. Yeah. So, if this is considered your carry, one of your two carry-ons, you're gonna get billed for it, or you know, charged for it, or just basically take you know it what? off and shove I it inside the carry-on. I was about to say, shove, on. shove the yeah. sporin into the carry-on, um, and obviously put the sporin onto the metal detector belt before you go through the metal yeah. detector. You know, yeah. If anything, I will say that that is one thing that is uh, more convenient and nice about kilting going on an airline is being able to put all your gear into the sporin and just run it through the metal detector. It's easier than having yeah. to empty your pockets. <clears throat> you know, so I kind of I kind of dig it from that sense, um, and I've never really gotten the hang of those the fanny pack thing. So. No. So there you go. Yeah. But, yeah, that's a good answer. Cool. Yeah. Got anything? All right. Uh, Travis asking uh, a question for, for both of you. Um, and this this would be when you come home from traveling. Um, how do you fully wash a wool kilt uh, at home? Is there any suggestions on detergent or a cleaner that he should use <coughs> when washing it? The I will give you instructions with the preface. If you are not comfortable or you're afraid of screwing it up, don't try this at home. Only do this if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Actually, I'll give them the, the, the bathtub instructions because it's a little bit easier. Yeah, okay. Um, you can, if you're going to wash it, you can wash it in a bathtub. Uh, basically, fill the bathtub up with lukewarm water. You don't want to go real hot. You don't want to real go, go real cold necessarily, but lukewarm water. Um, cooler than you would probably even bathe in. Um, pour in wool light um, is what I would probably use. And then you're going to basically soak the kilt in the water and you know, submerge it entirely so that the entire thing is wet. Then after you soak it, kind of you know, uh, pick it up and dunk it a bunch of times, swish it around gently. You don't want to agitate the wool. Agitating it is what will make it felt um, and will shrink the wool and it, that is irreversible. So don't you know, agitate it, don't, don't get angry at the wool. Um, then once, basically, once you've dunked it in there and soaked it in there, uh, I'd say leave it in there for about half hour, 45 minutes, and you know, kind of swish it around every five, 10 minutes or so. You're just trying to basically loosen the dirt particles and get them out. Um, after that's done, drain the entire tub, then fill it back up with regular water uh, with no detergent in it, and again, soak it and kind of you know, dunk the kilt in there a bunch of times. If you are going to, you're not gonna wring the kilt out, but if you wanna kind of like press some of the water out of it. Hmm. Um, once you're all done, you can do that, you know, drain all the water out and then either press the water out of it as best you can, or even better yet, lay down a couple towels, lay the kilt, like beach towels or regular towels. I don't know if they're going to be long enough, but um, lay the kilt down on top of the towels, straighten all the pleats out as best you can, and then lay a couple more towels on top of it and then either walk on it or lay on it or put something you know heavy on it hmm. and that kind of absorbs some of the moisture in the kilt so it can dry better or dry quicker. With the kilt still damp is when you're gonna wanna iron it uh, and you wanna make sure that you're, uh, you're using an iron on a the lowest steam setting, you're using a press cloth and we've, we've covered that in other kind of videos but um, when you wet wash a wool kilt, you will have to iron it. The pleats will come out of it. Um, so that being said, if you don't know what you're doing or you're scared to wet wash a kilt, take it to a dry cleaner. But don't have them press it necessarily. Correct. Yeah. That'd be the, the, the flip side of that. You know, I'm almost imagining like holding the, the wet kilt like up against the, the wall of the shower wall and just kind of like squeegeeing it out with my hand 
you know, trying to like get the get the press some of the water out or something like that. It might after. or or if you have one of those uh, like indoor um, like collapsible clothing rack things. Yeah, I use those for um, doing stuff all the time. Actually. Yeah, we use it for all of our like winter stuff when we go outside and play in the snow. Mm. Um, you can lay your kilt over there in top of in the bathtub. Lay your kilt over top of that to let the water, the majority of the water in the kilt, kind of drip dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, I, can I tell you something? Please. When you were describing dipping the kilt gently in the water and kind of swishing it around, you know what that reminded me of? No. When we used to use cloth diapers for my daughter, and just kind of gently dipping the diaper in the toilet and swishing it around. Yeah, I didn't use cloth diapers. <laughs> Not playing with my kids' poop. That's it's not not playful at all. Trust me. No, it's more. It's deadly efficient. It's a mechanical process. It's a ritual. It is not fun. That is all you, buddy. I know. Well, you know, keeping it real. Adam is about to have another child. Yeah. There's your chance now, Adam. Yeah. Cloth diapers. Cloth diapers. Did it with the first two. <laughs> so Are you doing it with this one as well? Don't know. That's up to the wife. <laughs> she gets the fuck. Hmm. Yeah, not it. <laughs> All, right. All right. Should I do another one? Yes, now? let's do okay, another let's one. Flip flop. Okay. Let's see. How do we? Kilts and culture, where we talk about everything from kilts to baby poop. Um, I'll get. I'll give you. A, let's keep <laughs> please, it on, keep please, it on a slightly weird level here. Um, Drew was asking us about sweater vests, and he's basically wondering about the mechanics of it. He's saying. If you're wearing a sweater vest with a kilt, do you actually cut the sweater vest shorter and rehem it in order to wear it with the kilt? Or do you just fold the bottom hem up inside or you just leave it as it is? I don't wear sweater vests, so it's gonna be, I'll give you my my thoughts on it. Um, I would either, I would either A, get a sweater vest that is shorter, if you can find one that's shorter, uh, or B, I would just kind of tuck it behind the sporin like I am with my regular sweater, yeah. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel the need to cut it and make it shorter unless. L let me put a caveat here: if you are five foot four and the vest is kind of long on you anyway, maybe then. Um, but I don't know how you would, since you're cutting it. You, I, I, yeah. I think I think um, with all due respect to Drew, I think you he was kind of overthinking it. Um, we do talk about the differences between Saxon wear and Highland wear very often about how jackets are shorter and various things are different proportions. But in this case, yeah, just go with a, a, a more form-fitting <coughs> sweater vest, maybe a size smaller. I wear sweater vests all the time with a kilt. Um, but I tend to, I'm enough of a, you know, old fogey that I like the more close-fitting, form-fitting sweater vests as opposed to the floppy ones that a lot of guys are into golf wear. I think a lot of sweater vests these days are cut kind of looser and baggier. Um, I would go with a, a one that fits you form well, fits your form well, and uh, you know, like you said, basically just tuck it behind the sporn if it's running a little long, or or do a little bit of a fold, you know, exactly just a, what I was just a little say. bit of a fold. Yeah. But um, or even even a lot of a fold. It's mm -hmm. literally you could almost make it you know, custom length by folding it. Let, let's say you know you bring it down to the top of the kilt and you're folding effectively you know four or five inches under. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't you know get too bulky. I don't and think it would necessarily be a problem. I, I would prefer to go with a slightly smaller form-fitting vest so that you don't have that extra layer of folded cloth on top of the cloth of the kilt, on top of the, possibly the kilt belt. But if it you went with bulkier a, and bulkier and bulkier. But if you went with a more form-fitting vest, it's going to be more obvious because it's form-fitting yeah, and then it tucks under. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I would... Uh, Try out. Yeah, buy some sweater vests on eBay or at a Goodwill shop and just experiment with it. That's what I do. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're gonna if you're gonna do an experiment on something like that, um, go to a Goodwill shop, find something that either you like or you don't care about. <laughs> that's only gonna cost you three, four bucks. Yeah. And then wreck that. You can almost always find sweater vests in Goodwill because there's only a select elite of us who actually appreciate them. So you you can you can usually find a good selection of sweater vests at Goodwill. So yeah. All the people that wear them. Never mind. I'm, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm censoring myself. Okay. No. Mac, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> All right. We got two uh, two footwear questions here. Okay. Uh, Scott is asking what our thoughts are on Doc Martens with a kilt. And then Cameron is asking about um, a scene mentioned to monk straps and what our thoughts are with those with a kilt. Monk straps. Get clarification on monk straps because I have no idea what he's talking about. Okay. I'm wondering if it's um, like a Birkenstock or something like that. Oh. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. In the meantime... 
Doc Martens are fine. Yeah. Um, we wear Doc Martens with kilts, um, police boots, They're pretty grinders. much classic at this point, really. Yeah. Yeah. So not a problem. Yeah, not a problem that, well, at that's all. A, that's a good question. Have they reached, have combat boots, um, let's, let's cut it at, let's say, the 10 holes. Not, okay. the, not you know, knee high, yeah. but have 10 hole combat boots reach the point, and I'm going beyond the kilt thing, in, in culture where it's like acceptable shoe wear. Oh yeah. In general. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, even with shorts. Um, I don't think they look great with a lot of shorts unless you're wearing like baggy um, um, skater shorts, um, which I wear uh, sometimes. Um, but uh, then, then it's more of that, you get the punk rock kind of, punk rock goth skater, you know, slacker kind of look going with the, with the sort. I'm, I'm dating myself, I know, but, but. Did you just um, call punk rock and goth kids slackers? No, I'm just saying there's a, no, okay. there's a third genre. I'm thinking like okay. going back to the 90s with the, um. The grunge, grunge kind look. Of thing. Got it, yeah, got it, got I think, okay. I think combat boots have been a standard piece of clothing wear. Yeah. Since the 90s, easily. Um, they're not edgy. I wouldn't, anymore. I wouldn't, not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, that's why. That's why in my scene and like in the goth scene, you get more and more extreme-looking boots with a lot more accessories attached to them and, and fancy stuff because regular combat boots are just regular combat boots. Yeah. So yeah, I would say, do like you normally would. Get a pair of Docs or other boots that you really like the the fit of, and uh, you know you can afford. And Docs are worth the money. So yeah, it's, yeah, you can't go wrong with them, honestly. Yeah, it's interesting to see that. To, to think of, like, I haven't even really thought about that kind of thing, but to think about that now compared to when I got my first pair of Doc Martens back in 1991, 92, somewhere around there, that one of the first comments I got from a girl in the school was, oh, you have skinhead shoes now. And I'm like, but they're just freaking boots. No, everybody um, has. So, but, like, now it's just ubiquitous. Everybody has them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then probably want to scunch the uh, kilt hose down. Yeah. Everybody always asks about kill hose with the combat boots, and you could do either way. I personally like the scrunch down look, not the up with the flashes look. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. But. It's you don't have to wear kill hose with combat boots. If you do, squish them down. If you don't, just wear a regular pair of you know cotton crew socks and pull them up so that they stick you know a little bit out of the top of the boots. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Mr. Mac. Or yeah, Mac Did has you one. A... You got a picture of it. Yeah. Um. I didn't see the picture. Yeah, Max is gonna show it to you. The, oh, okay. I'm not a... I dig them. I'm not a big fan of them with kilts. I don't like buckle brogues either, though. I don't so have, I don't I know. Have, I have no problem with them at all. They're, they're just It's just another variety of a dress shoe. Um, I would just default to the don't mix your blacks and browns leathers, because I'm a typical American that way. Um, if the shoes are black, make sure your other accessories are black. If you got brown sporn, wear brown shoes. Um, I think they're pretty cool looking. I kind of dig them. I'm not sure they're me. But they're not bad. Yeah. It's a slightly retro look to them in a way. Yeah, I would wear them with pants maybe. I would not wear them with a kilt myself. I'm not I'm not a huge fan of buckle type shoes. Um, so that may just be my bias showing there. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't wear them with a kilt for me. But there's, but, there, but there's no, but that's a personal fashion choice as opposed to, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing in the conventions of Highland wear that would say that you should avoid that particular kind of dress shoe. You know what I mean? No, it's. I would not wear platforms. No. Yeah, I wouldn't wear, wouldn't wear Teva. Uh, <laughs> flip flops. Right. It's yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to say on that one. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little stuck on that one because I they're personally not would say it's neutral. They look, style. they look fine to me. Um, our usual rule of thumb with shoes is don't have them distract from the rest of the outfit. So, as long as your shoes are not like you know, neon green alligator skin, I think you're probably fine. Fair depends, on, depends on the kilt you're wearing. I suppose. Do you have the feather, you know, the pimp hat and the, you know, the feather sticking I out would. and everything? I would totally do that. The cane, the bow and mm -hmm. Sweet. Yep. <laughs> well, speaking of your outfits, what tartans are you guys I was going to say, we have to, we have to do that uh, bit of business yet. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. Mr. Eric. Scott Red Muted. This is my favorite red tartan. I don't usually go for really red stuff. So that's unusual for me. But uh, I really like the brick red in this particular... Muted, I always tend to veer towards muted tartans, actually, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this one is the uh, Federal Memorial Tartan. Um, it is in honor of the, the Union soldiers who fought in the, fought in the Civil War. There are a, there's a Confederate Memorial Tartan, there's a Federal Memorial, and a Union Memorial Tartan as well. Um, so, I'm 
wearing the Federal Memorial because my great great grandfather, great great great, I don't know, one some somewhere back there mm -hmm. fought at Gettysburg. Cool. So, yes. I could do either one. I had uh, relatives on both sides. Nice. So, yeah. I've never really considered buying either of them, but I have the Philadelphia one, which is similar enough. So, yeah. maybe I should look at the Confederate Fair. one at some point. But, Ugh. Confederates. <laughs> Just like the colors, you know. Um, <laughs> Anything else? Any questions there, Mac, or should um, I do one? Well, let's go back to the cleaning uh, thing again. Uh, okay. Jimmy's asking about spats. Um, after a couple of parades and they get a little, little dirt and a little mud and a little yep. grime on them, is there any suggestions on cleaning them? Bleach? Uh, yeah. I don't have anything. Yeah. It's Spats are basically made of canvas fabric. Um, and for those of you that don't know, that don't know they're generally white um, with either white or black buttons. Um, they're worn on the shoes, so they're going to be, you know, down at the ground. So if you're marching around in the rain, you're going to get muddy. Yeah. Um, realistically, there's not a lot you can do outside of bleaching them, OxyClean, that kind of thing. Yeah, I was going to say, like, tooth, a toothbrush and OxyClean. Yeah. Just get in there and spot clean as best you can, pre-treat, scrub it. Yeah. That's, yeah, sorry. Spats, spats are a weird thing. I'm amazed as how many bands really still like them. I guess if you're in an urban yeah. environment, maybe you don't think about it. That's a military look, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, we still need those vinyl, those PVC spats we were talking about. Yes. Yeah. All, All right, right. ready? One of the preloaded ones. Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay. Adam, I think that camera clicked, just so you know. Uh, Karen was uh, asking us about sporins, and she was saying, uh, when you're selecting a fur sporin, which pelts tend to be the most popular or the most historically used and uh, why are they usually saved for more formal occasions? Why do you tend to wear fur for formal and not day? Uh, price, um, <laughs> concern with ruining it. Uh, yeah. That's generally where I would go on that. Mm -hmm. The uh, firstborns are traditionally worn. It's it's a practicality thing. Would you wear a tuxedo to the to the mall? <laughs> Adam might, <laughs> um, but. No, generally you reserve your, your better clothes, your more expensive clothes for formalish or dress kind of functions where they're not yeah. really as much of a chance of getting mud on them mm -hmm. um, or, you know, dirt or schmutz or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's the that's generally why they're reserved for that. Um, and day sporns are, you know, made of leather. It's, you know, you spill mm -hmm. something on it, you're fine. Now, in terms of historiosity, shall we say, um, where are the most historical furs versus more popular furs now. Um, We've touched on this before, I know, but yeah, I'm no. curious. Um, historical furs to for a sporn to be made out of. Um, the, number one, it has, it has to be seal. Um, mm -hmm. Seal is the most common fur that's used for sporns in Scotland. It was illegal for five years, <laughs> a few years ago. Um, but seal is a very, uh, there's a few reasons. Number one, seals are reasonably large animals. So you can get a lot of you know, sporins out of a single hide. Two, they're very, very hard wearing. Um, it will look good day one and year 50. It, mm. you know, unless you're wearing it every single day, you know, it's uh, the sides of the sporin uh, on the gusset would rub off over time. But, you know, it's much less so with seal just because of how hard wearing they are. Okay. Um, a similar type of fur uh, would be bovine or cow. Again, it's a, uh, a, a well, they, they, they clip the actual hair, um, but it is a, uh, a hard wearing and you know, larger skin for the animal, so it's easier to make a lot of sporns out of. Um, the ones that I don't like that are popular as well would be like rabbit, um, mm -hmm. things that shed a lot. Um, right. Rabbit fur, if you ever, uh, to me, this is gonna sound weird, um, Rabbit fur feels kind of like cat, like cat hair, like it sheds a lot. Um, mm. It's not like you can you can do this and pull a lot of hair off of a fur or off of the, the sporn or off of the <laughs> off of a cat or a, or a rabbit if you want to. Um, so I'm less of a fan of rabbit hair because it is not nearly as hard wearing. Mm. Um, badger, fox, yep. uh, musquash are other popular ones. Um, Badger's an old one. Yeah, badger is a, was was very popular back in the 19th century. Yeah, um, I was gonna say um, goat is one that you don't see as often nowadays, but yeah. I think yeah. it's coming back a little bit. 
for people who are looking for something different and kind of retro. But that was a hugely popular uh, pelt for Sworns up through the 19th and early 20th century. I think it probably goat probably went away when the sp when the, the the style of Sporns came to be a more short hair. Yeah. Um, so it's just basically the outline of the Sporn versus horse hair and goat hair Sporns were much much longer. You know, yeah. twelve or eighteen inches versus eight or so inches tall. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, badger. Would you say that raccoon was a substitute for badger for a while, or still yeah. is? Yeah. It's it's we are now in a global economy. Right. When you know when when it was you know. Scotland and your sporum was made of the animals that were in your area, mm -hmm. then it would have been what's in your area. Um, right. Now that it's more, you know, uh, our sporum guy can get furs from Italy or from the Orient or from like all over the world, mm -hmm. um, then you can get more exotic furs. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'd say that, you know, badger, raccoon, you're right, is another one that's kind of very similar. Mm -hmm. um, the, the only thing that I don't like personally about some fox or uh, some badger, definitely raccoon, is how puffy it is. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to yeah. say that. Yeah, they get kind like of fluffy. A, the hair's kind of stick out. It becomes you know, yeah. much more, you know, much more, Yeah, much more of a ball <laughs> in your crotch versus an actual spore in shape. I'm not going to pursue that thought any further. Fair but, enough. Uh, Thank you for not doing um, that. You know what? But but you talk about the, um, the, the more exotic stuff. Um, occasionally you'll run into cases where people have taken... Uh, Furs from objects, uh, which because the animals are not hunted anymore, but um, like occasionally you'll find a sporn which was made out of tiger pelt, which came off of a tiger skin rug, or you'll find one yep. that's made out of zebra pelt, or something really funky like that. And that that reminds, in turn, that makes me think of the um, the feather sporns, where it's like like grouse uh, feathers or pheasant feathers or owl I've seen, mm -hmm. where instead of fur you have just like, just layers and layers of, of the feathers. Do you have an opinion on feather sporns? Are they like funky um, fashion, or are they a throwback, or are they the, more trouble than they're worth? Uh, there's a, uh, a spore maker, I believe she's in the north of Scotland, uh, called Kate McPherson, and her claim to fame, or the way she started her company, basically, mm -hmm. was making sporns from roadkill. Yep, I was gonna um, say, yeah, roadkill. So yep. she, th there's, I saw a video documentary on her, or, or a news piece, or whatever. Um, and they basically, they interviewed her and she was like, yeah, you know, I saw, you know, that animal on the side of the road and I thought, you know, oh, that's, it's, it's a shame. It's a beautiful animal. And she, I forget how she ended up making a spore from it, whether she had to tan it herself or whether she took it to somebody to be tanned. Um, but she started her business that way. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny, the funny thing was, she's like, yeah, all of a sudden, all my neighbors are bringing me dead animals that they find on the side of the road. <laughs> saying, hey, can you make a spore for me? thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. They're like cats bringing you animals and trophies. Sean, them go feet. get the mail. <laughs> what do we get today? Oh, it's two skunks and a raccoon, Mom. You know. The uh, yeah. but she started making uh, uh, bird sporns, so sp sporns from like pheasant okay. or different kinds of, of birds. Um, so I was was I wrong in thinking that's an old time thing? Is that totally a modern thing then? I don't know if it's an old time thing. I'm huh. not okay. I, Maybe it's just who I can't her. see. Yeah, I can't remember, I'm going through my mental Rolodex, I can't remember seeing any photos or old timey, you know, photog like all the McClay prints and that kind of thing, the McKeon prints. Yeah, yeah. I can't think no, of any no, no. of them. No, definitely not. With a, with a bird sporn. If it's old, I wouldn't think it would go past like the 1930s. Yeah, and likely. I can't even think but, of like old yeah. advertising stuff that we've seen from mm -hmm. the 40s and 50s um, with that in it. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess. It's more modern. It's a more modern thing. Yeah. Um, I'd be worried about it. I'd be worried that it's too delicate to... So, well, I don't know. Feathers are pretty. Feathers are actually really yeah, we, hardy. Yeah, we, we have a couple birds. Um, we have two birds that are our pets, mm -hmm. um, and they're the feathers are reasonably hardy. Um, the problem is a if you rub a feather the wrong way, you're gonna yeah. rip the quills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it'll all forever be kind of like you know pointing out like that. Yeah. Um, or I'd be worried that they would you know come out. I don't know how they're affixed to the sporin. That's a good question um, too. And it know. doesn't. They don't really flex like. A yeah. skin would. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not a big fan of it. I've seen some, and they kind of. It's one of those things where it looks cool, but I don't know how. I wouldn't want to necessarily own it, but it's. I look at it and go, huh. I can appreciate the time and effort put into making it. I can appreciate the beauty of it, but yeah. it's just not for me. Yeah. It's kind of like how I feel about Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Always back to alcohol. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I have to disagree with you there because yeah. I, lo I love Guinness. But, Fair enough. Um, yeah, I would say that that would be something you'd have to like keep in a plastic bag all year round and bring out like once a year. Very special occasion thing. Now, in terms of furs that are popular, um, if you want something really, really vintagey looking, then something like Badger or Bovine would be a good choice. Badger is harder to find. Um, bovine is very hard wearing and, and pretty easy to find and also more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, I'd Fox. say Fox is probably the single most popular fancy fur that we sell at least. Um, and in terms of how you choose one, it really is idiosyncratic. I mean, you don't have to worry about the color of the pelt matching your tartan or not matching your tartan unless it's a very bright red fox. Um, but in most cases, you're getting more earth tone <coughs> colors, or if you get a skunk one, it's just black and white. Um, you don't really need to worry about toning with the tartan where a pelt is concerned. Am I correct on that? Is yeah. that pretty much true? Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. You do, the sporn stands on, stands on its own. Right. Don't worry about the sporn matching your tartan, matching your jacket, mm -hmm. matching your hair on your head, does not right. matter. Right. Just pick the sporn you like, that's it. But not rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. No rabbit. No, no rabbit for you. Cool. Got another one, Mac? Yeah. Uh, you want me to do one? Okay. Liam is asking, what the, what's the difference between a dice Glengarry and a regular Glengarry? Is there a difference? Or is one it's meant to use for something versus the other one? One has dicing. <laughs> the other and one does not. is plain. Um, I think the construction is pretty similar. Now, if it's a Balmoral, then the the dicing portion is some Balmorals are more like a, a like a beret, but you know like a military you know beret. But um, a Balmoral it has the dicing band, definitely has more of like a tam kind of a construction. It's got the the the, 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 the disc of the of the top of the hat, and it's got the uh, the band of the dicing. In terms of a Glengarry, I would just say that it's going to look much more regimental and British military, and I would advise against wearing it. Personally, from a style style point, as a civilian, I wouldn't do the dicing. Um, it definitely feels to me more like a band thing. Um, unless you're a lead singer of a punk rock band, in which case, you know, if you happen to be, what's his name? Paul McKenzie. If, he's Paul McKen if you're Paul McKenzie, you wear the damn Dice Glengarry, and it's cool. But um, I prefer the straight-up black one if you're a civilian. Um, diced, I just see more often with um, with pipe bands. And if you're asking about the history of dicing on these hats, I'd have to research it for you. Um, it definitely goes back to uniform conventions, unless you have any input on that off the top of your head, Mac. No. Yeah, okay. That's what I can tell you right now. And for those of you who don't know what dicing is, it is oh, basically the uh, around the base of the hat, around the band, right around the forehead, um, it's either going to be red and black. It's basically a checkerboard kind of pattern, similar to a checkerboard. Or white and um, red. Or white and red that goes yeah. all the way around the base of the, of the hat. Yep, yep. And if you don't know who the real Mackenzies are, and if you're into punk music at all, you should check them out. Or rock. Or rock, yeah. 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 They're old now. They're slowing down a little bit. Yeah, but the music's so, still good. The yeah, recordings no. are oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. All right, should I do another one? Yep. Okay. Fun fact, <laughs> we made kilts for some of the guys in the Real Mackenzie's. Oh, yeah. And a uh, uh, skunk sporn for Matt McNasty, who used to be their bagpiper. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah, they should, cool they should guys. Come back, they should come back for more. Absolutely. I'm assuming they're all watching right now, and they're going to come. Of course come, they are. And they're going to break it They're our the biggest door. fans. Yeah, absolutely. All right. This right. I've been wanting to do this question all week. All right. Jeff Walter, and we might all have opinions on this, actually, but yours is going to count the most. Jeff was asking us, what is the cringiest tartan you have ever seen? For him, it's the Friendship Tartan uh, that was done for the uh, upcoming <coughs> World Jamboree, you know, Boy Scouts thing. Um, he had another question about kill pins, but we'll talk about that later. So what is the cringiest, most tacky, horrible ugh, tartan in history of the world? That's a tall order right there. I um, know, I know it is. It, I'll, I'll give you... Examples, but on a theme. Um, tartan, basically, uh, tartans come within certain color palettes, generally. Modern tartans generally use darker greens, navy blues. Muteds use, you know, blood red, olive green, and like a stormy sky blue. Ancients use a paler shade of those colors. Um, tartans, to me, that are, the tartans, to me, that are the most hideous are the ones that use, like, 
bold, garish colors. Mm -hmm. um, there are too many to count, like, but it can be a, a regular tartan that just has a garish colorway. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, a lot of uh, lower kilts in the lower end of the market are actually made in Pakistan. And one of the things that they did not do well up until recently, they're starting to get a little bit better at it, um, was the color choices that they used, especially in their acrylic kilts. Acrylic, yeah. They're, they are colors that are not found in nature, and if you look at them for too long, they will hurt your eyes. <laughs> there is a, uh, the Isle of Sky Tartan. It was actually a, a copyrighted tartan that's designed uh, by Rosemary Samoys, and she's from Australia, and it's you know, done only by La Karen and Martin Mills, two mills over in the UK. And Pakistan decided that they were going to do the Isle of Sky tartan and kind of knock it off. And the colors in this kilt, we have a sample of it over in the shop. I've got to check if we mm -hmm. still have it. Mm -hmm. The colors in this kilt are ungodly. They are hideous. Um, the, Isle of Sky, the Isle of Sky tartan is so uh, beautifully done in Scotland and it's so, like, all the colors kind of tone well together. They all blend. It's a very nice, like, classy tartan. And they ruined it. Um, so anything with garish colors are generally ones that I don't like. Now, I'll give you a Scottish example. Mm -hmm. The tartan that was done for the 2014 uh, Commonwealth Games yep. in Glasgow. That was going to be my pick. You stole my thunder. The, the it, Commonwealth tartan. It uh, is yep. hideous. Yep. They used, I uh, actually talked to, it was they, they was woven by House of Edgar, and it was hideous, but not because of them. Um, I actually talked to the, their sales manager today. I was talking to him about it and said, uh, what what were you thinking? And he, he literally said, it wasn't our fault. Uh, yeah. They they had a national competition mm -hmm. across all of Scotland to see, uh, like in, in elementary schools, mm -hmm. to see you know who could come up with the best design. And in fairness, the design itself isn't that bad, but the colors that they used are the colors that are in the Commonwealth Games oh, okay. logo. Okay. So okay. they are logo colors, so they are bright, bold colors, which yeah. are great for a logo, yep. not good for kilts. <laughs> so it is this like garish yep. green color, yep. bright freaking yellow, stripe in the middle, bright royal blue and yep. bright red yep. and uh it's it didn't sell well <laughs> <laughs> go figure and i'm really not surprised it's, so uh, yeah yep, that's my vote is yeah. the 2014 commonwealth game starting um another good another another good bad one is uh, i think jacobite Jacobite Tartan. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Mac. That's a love or hate it. Are you you're nodding here? I'm nodding with that. <coughs> Jacobite? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's makes a statement. There's some just from working on them that are are just they're good, but they're hideous because of what they do to your eyes when you're working on them. Okay. Like okay. Like I like shepherd's check. Shepherd's check. Shepherd's check. Shepherd's I mean, check. You get vertigo so in that thing across tartan, the machine. But it's yeah. It, it, it's I like it. It's just you eyes. Your eyes bug way yeah. out doing that. Yeah. One. It's like a nineteen six. It's like the openings of a nineteen sixties mystery movie. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's shepherd's mm -hmm. check for those who don't know are basically a black and white checkerboard. Um, or if you know like the uh, a buffalo check shirt. That's red and black. Mm -hmm. That's actually that is actually a real tartan. It's called the Rob Roy tartan. Um, so, the Rob Roy McGregor tartan actually. The um, that's another one. Generally, Mac, those are at least the Rob Roy has a slightly wider, wider squares. Yes. The Shepherd's check. The, the set size is what three quarters of an inch. Yeah. Like it's yeah. literally tiny little yeah. squares. Yeah, that's hideous. Yeah. Yep. I, I think. But, we, yeah, Adam. <laughs> anything? Oh. Uh, I, I will step in as a fan of the Jacobite Tartan. Really? I, okay. I don't know. Okay. I, I kind of like it. Um, hopefully Ben doesn't come over here and attack us all for, uh, <laughs> for, for what has his been favorite. said. I, I, and I'm yep. not saying that just to stay safe from Ben next time I see him. Um, mm. Shepherd's check. Ben's another one we, of our, one we of our team We threaten ourselves guys, yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Shepherd's check, I, I do have to say, is, is pretty brutal. I, not quite tartan, but I, I remember I saw Mac working on it early when I got here, and I think I nearly had a stroke. Oh, yeah. When I saw him oh, yeah. moving it across the machine. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty Oh, it's worse brutal. when it's on the cutting table. 
Oh, no, yeah, it's a test like pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, like, it like pulsates. Yeah, it does. Mac, <laughs> Mac, what is that also? Shepherd's check is also known as. Um, it's like a national tartan, but it's the. the uh, darn it! Now it's gonna. I shouldn't have opened my mouth because I can't think of which. It's one of the Kel it, Umb Umbrian. Is it Umbrian tartan? Maybe. Yeah. I think it's up. that. Yeah, we'll look yeah. it up and then yeah. we'll. I can I can look at <coughs> the Google machines. We'll cut me sounding smart into the video later on. So Eric, here's for the cutting. Oh, I remember now. It's the. Yeah. <laughs> Parton. Okay. Um, we could go on about this, and we shouldn't because uh, some no. people frustrate somebody. Fair um, enough. Yes. All right. But, so hopefully we haven't insulted your favorite tartans. Right. But if we have, <laughs> a, a bold tartan is not necessarily a bad tartan. Yes. Loud McLeod. Everybody jokes about Loud McLeod. I think Loud McLeod is actually pretty cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it so takes a certain personality to, yeah. to pull it off. Yeah. And you gotta Loud own McLeod. it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. But uh, but yeah, there's uh, yeah. <laughs> I agree. We, we could go on and on. <laughs> All right, Mac. I think it's your turn for a question. Okay. We have. Since we're in the nice little weather phase we're in, Kevin is asking, uh, where can you find a nice summer weight flat cap? Uh, this cold winter is almost over, and it's time to put his 100% <laughs> wool uh, cap away. So oh, he's is looking it now? for something a little lighter. Winter's um, almost over. <laughs> huh. okay. Summer flat caps are generally made of linen or cotton. Yeah. Um, uh, they don't always have the same feel as a wool one for looking Celtic. Yeah. They don't look Irish to me the same way. They, yeah. I think I think Kangol. I think golf hat when I think of a lightweight flat cap. Yeah. Um, if you like the close fitting ones, uh, there's a, a company called the Boston Scally Company. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe that's the name of them. Um, they're oddly Scally enough caps, yeah. in Boston. Um, and they make a few different models and they're they're much more the, the dome close to the head, shorter brim model, whereas a traditional flat cap is generally a little bit wider, poofier on the head and sticks out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, either company like Boston Scalico or um, go to, uh, I find a lot of Scally caps at like Ross or like discount, you know, yeah. chain stores yeah. uh, will often have a, a flat cap section. Mm -hmm. And I think I, one of my old ones was a Dockers. Um, Dockers made one that was pretty yeah. cool that was linen. And for it, the was cotton black. linen ones, yeah. Yeah. I think it's because a lot of golf guys would wear them for golfing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Shepherd's check. It is um, is also known as the Falkirk Tartan. Falkirk, yes. yes. And it, well, that's um, similar. And it's as not... early as 1760s with the Duke of, of Ar uh, North Umberland. Umberland. Umberland yes. is it. Mm, I knew it started with a U. <laughs> I Got think that. He... That's the Umberland Tartan. I used to know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Splice that in. It is okay. We'll do. <laughs> um, yeah, it is similar to it is, sim it is similar to the Falkirk fragment. Which is technically um, is technically a, a, a tweed twill, not a tartan, but uh, it's in the hist it's in the uh, the lineage of tartan. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 similar, more similar to Celtic fabrics that come out of the the Celtic age, the Iron Age, you know, in on the continent, like Hallstatt. Um, but yeah, that's the one that was wrapped around some coins or found in a jar, yep. in an archaeological site. Yep. Yes. Very good, good. Good call. Eric, read another one. Sure. Uh, Greg was asking us if we could discuss the feel and visual look of PV kilts uh, versus a similarly weighted wool kilt. Uh, are there <laughs> advantages to the PV beyond the price uh, and therefore uh, less fear of harming the kilt? In other words, is it just the fact that you don't it's have to worry about it yeah. cheaper and you don't have to worry about washing it, <clears throat> blah, blah, blah? Or is there other things to consider with PV? Sure. Um, PV stands for polyviscose. Polyester and effectively rayon. Viscose is a fancy British word for rayon, effectively. Um, polyester viscose kilts are great for a few reasons. Number one, if, as you're alluding to in the question, if you are on a budget, they are going to be less expensive. The material that we get is wove, woven in the UK at one of the same mills that weaves our uh, wool cloth. The the density, of the, it's very, very dense fabric. It's, it's good quality that way for us for making a kilt. Um, material weight is about 11 to 12 ounces. It feels in your hand, like when you when you actually you know, rub the surface of it, like a very thick cotton. Um, mm -hmm. it takes a crease very well. It's coated with Teflon. So if you spill beer on it or spill coffee on it, um, it's just basically just gonna roll right off. 
Um, it's anti-pill fiber technology, whatever they call it. Um, so it doesn't get those little bumps on the surface of the fabric like acrylic would or like most synthetic fabrics. Over time, that coating will kind of come off. So that's why we recommend not dry cleaning a, yeah. a PV kilt. Yeah. But you're, you're right in that it is less expensive, therefore you, and it is stain resistant, therefore you can do a mud run in it. You can go camping in it. You can wear it to the Highland Games, get your, your tack on it and that kind of stuff. So it's, it is a good cost-effective and hard-wearing alternative to wool. The, in the lower end of the market, there's a lot of different types of fabric. There's wool blends, there's acrylic, there's you know all kinds of different synthetics, cotton poly blends. Um, the PV fabric that we actually use for our casual and semi-traditional kilts is the only fabric that we've seen that we would actually want to put our name on. Um, it is it is good enough for us to put our name on in the lower end of the market. There's other fabrics out there, there's cheaper fabrics out there, but to us, the quality just isn't there in the cloth, either because of the denseness of the weave is too loose or something like that. But it's, yeah, it's, the PV is a very good alternative. And also, if you uh, have a wool allergy, it's great for that angle as well. Now, I will say from the aesthetic standpoint, which I think was the other part of the question, um, it does tend to look a more flat. It doesn't have the same body that wool does. And it doesn't have necessarily the same uh, swing to it. It won't. Your, your pleats will not look as impressive when you're in motion. I mean, you get that swish effect when you're walking from the pleats. And a wool kilt will always look better uh, in motion, I think, than the poly viscose. It bounces. Yeah, it's got a little bit yeah. stiffer hand to it. It'll, uh, yeah. Wool has a little bit stiffer hand and will bounce more. Yeah. Um, it's also the weight, the heavier Yeah, he was, the trying, material. To, he was trying to say if you had a PV kilt and a yeah. wool kilt that were exactly the same weight. That's hard for me to imagine. Now I, I would be weird. I would say this: um, the the fabric looking flatter, like if you physically lay it on the table, yeah. um, the PV it may look flatter for two reasons. Number one, the yarn it, there's no yarn, little tiny hairs sticking it's a low out. Nap. Yeah, low nap, if you will. Yeah. Um, number two, if you're looking at 11 ounce wool and 11 ounce PV, mm -hmm. it may look more similar because okay. the the twill lines that are actually in the fabric, the little diagonal lines on a 16 or a 13 ounce kilt are gonna be more pronounced yeah, because it's true, a, true. a larger yarn used in the fabric. Yeah, yeah so it's, more, it's sense? finer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the is gonna look a lot finer. Yeah. So, interesting point. It's, yeah. Think of it this way. It's like if you have a, a, a fine wool suit, it looks, the material on the back looks much flatter than right. a right. wool kilt would. Right. And again, lower nap and the fact that it's you know a, a lighter weight fabric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm defending PV. How dare you, sir? No, I'm just saying they're appropriate for different things. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. I love my PV for summer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah different horses for different courses. Mm -hmm. Back. All right. AJ is asking, uh, how should one go about slightly lengthening the sleeves on an Argyle jacket? His fits perfectly when wearing French cuffs, but is a little <coughs> concerned it looks maybe a little silly with wearing a regular shirt. Mm. There, it depends on the individual jacket. There's no stock, you know, broad sweeping answer here. Um, a lot of times when clothing manufacturers make jackets, they'll leave a little bit of extra fabric effectively turned up inside the cuff. So take it to a tailor local to you or a dry cleaner with a tailoring service, if you trust them, and um, have them look at the sleeve of the jacket. Uh, I know one, the, the red regulation doublet that we have in the store here, um, we used it for a photo shoot and Rob, the guy who was wearing a jacket at the photo shoot, he had, you know, gorilla arms. His arms were really long. So Mac actually undid the, you know, moved the sleeve of the jacket from just basically right up in the cuff and, you know, rolled it down and re-ironed it at a different spot, which fit him perfectly then. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, as I was saying, there's a little bit of extra fabric in the sleeve. I'm not saying you're gonna be able to get two inches out of it, but if you're looking for an extra half inch, a lot of times they can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's more difficult or more annoying for a tailor to do on a gauntlet cuff than on like a Braemar cuff. No, I'm, no, 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 because you're not, yes not, and we're no. We're not moving. You're not moving the whole cuff. Okay. You're literally just, what is underneath there, mm -hmm. you're literally just doing this and rolling a little bit of extra sure. fabric out. It's so think, do, the, do those raised stitches go all the way under when they do that then? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, okay, they go so all the way under. Be fine. Yeah, and then the okay. then the lining basically comes down to the bottom, and then 
comes back a little bit. Okay. It's just folded and uh, not tacked, but it's folded and creased right at that spot with the allowance of you know rolling it out a little bit. I see. At least on ours. Again, your mileage may vary depending on the individual jacket where that you, you have there, right. where you got it from, and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's oftentimes it is able to be adjusted a little bit. Okay. Cool. Cool. Hopefully that helps. Right. Yep. Another one. Let's see. Uh, Margaret was asking us, um, how do you go about registering a new tartan, and how expensive does it cost? Are they going to require a woven sample? Um, I explain who they <clears throat> is. Yeah. yeah. For a tartan to be official, it is recorded with the uh, Scottish Tartan Registry. That's a the governing body over in Scotland. It's actually a, uh, a subsection of one of their departments in the government. Um, you have to have a design. If you need to design a tartan, plug, plug. Uh, <laughs> we have a tartan designer on our website. It's free to use. Have at it. Um, but fun. once you have the thread count and the colors in the tartan, you give that design to the tartan register. They're going to want to know the thread sequence. They're going to want to know the rationale for designing the tartan, if there's any reasoning behind it or, or meaning behind the colors, behind the thread count, behind any of it, or none of it. You just like the design. Um, they're also going to need to know the registrant details, which are your name, address, phone number, that kind of stuff. Um, and they're going to want to know if there are any restrictions on it. And by restrictions, they mean, are you allowing other people to weave it? or to, to do anything with it, or do you want to keep it just for yourself? Mm. Um, oftentimes, commercial entities will say, it is restricted, it is just, it is our tartan, no one's allowed to weave it. For our firefighter and law enforcement tartans, we designed those, and we put restrictions on them, and we actually copyrighted them in the States, but we don't want anyone doing those because we give a portion of charity. Now, you don't have to have it restricted. You can let anyone weave it um, if you're not doing it for commercial purposes. That generally, the the registration timeline is generally a couple weeks depending on their backlog. Um, Price-wise, I think it's 70 quid for uh, just the actual registration and a certificate. Um, you can get the certificate mounted and stuff like that for an extra 30 or so. Um, so $70 or 70 quid right now is about Hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks, somewhere in there. Um, so That's not bad. yeah, it's not a yeah. it's not a super you know intensive process. It's actually a little bit easier than most people think. Now, the tartan register does want a sample if it is woven, so they kind of bug you for it. It's not something that you have to do. It's not illegitimate, or if it's not woven or anything like that. Um, but if you do have it woven, they want it just for their archives. Basically, they're just trying to. The whole point of the Tartan Register is to archive all of this data for future generations. So what they're actually looking for is the electronic data and, if you have it woven, a physical scrap of it. And it will live in their library over there and it will be there for generations to come so you will be part of history. Now how have we handled that in the past when we've helped a customer with a custom Tartan and we've wound it, gotten, gotten it woven for them? Do we? submit samples back to the register? Or do we leave it to the customer to do that or? If uh, either or both, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, if we design a tartan and we register it, then we would send a sample over to the register. Okay. Um, if, or on behalf of the customer, or okay. if they design it and they register it, I just, you know, they get the extra scraps of cloth. and So they can do so. Yeah, yeah. do whatever they want. Now, my next question is, what if you decide to change some of the information about a tartan you would register. Like a couple years down the later down the line, you decide to um, either alter the thread count. Yeah, or no, not even designing the changing the design so much as um, although it's question two, uh, but like dropping the restrictions or adding restrictions or changing the description. You know, like you know, well, that color is really more for my mom than for my dog. Yeah, I mean, can you change how the write up is or the? I I will I will say this. Yes, you can change it. Um, I had a little bit of a, uh, a tiff, if you will, um, <laughs> with uh, somebody at the register, uh, the Irish Heritage Tartan, which I designed in 2005. Um, I hadn't really done anything with, and then when I, because I did the American Heritage and a bunch of other things, when we finally, we did one weave of it with Dog Leash, and it was, it came out horrible. Um, so we never really did anything with the design, and then about six years ago or so, we changed the design, not a ton, but we changed it. Um, and we said, okay, we need to let the register know. 
because they are the official record keepers. Right. Um, so we went to the to the registry and said, okay, well, hey, just so you know, we you know had this tartan design before. We changed, we altered the design. This is ultimately what it is. This is what we are selling as Irish Heritage. This is our tartan. So you know, please update your records. And they said, okay, it's fifty pounds to change the register. Okay. And I said, uh, what? I've already paid to register it. This is just an update because I want to make sure your records are correct. Uh -huh. And they said, okay, well, it's 50 pounds for us to update the records. And I said, okay, your records are wrong then. Thanks. Like, that was it. Mm -hmm. It was one of those, mm -hmm. like, I I didn't see why we had to pay to, for them to, you know, change to what it was. Okay. I get that there was administrative costs and whatever. Yeah. But it was literally just a matter of, like, you know, a few buttons and it's done. It, so. it could be. It could be also a minor chill factor, intentionally to stop people from doing willy nilly changes. It, I mean, every rule has a basis somewhere. It's possible that they had somebody who was like coming back every three weeks and saying, "Nah, I changed my mind," and they decided to try and put a stop to that so it just wasn't chaos. I'm guessing. But I'm guessing it was more. more it was a government. Bureaucracy. It was a bureaucracy okay. thing. It was All a right. government. There's a charge for every single thing. You want to change it, right. you pay. Right. And I was just like, "Well, fine. Then your stuff's wrong." Uh -huh. This this exists. Uh -huh. The point for the register is to record the tartans that exist in the world right. and catalog them. Right. This exists. You're now incorrect. So okay, eh, it is what it is. Cool. But don't let the costs or whatever scare you. And basically anything yeah. you go into that description. You yeah. Can, you know whatever whatever story is behind your tartan, they will record that information for you. Within right? reason. Okay. If it is racist, homophobic, ba 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 ba, um, they will say no. Okay. They have the right to do that. Sure. Or if it is not what they deem correct, they will do something different or make you alter things. Um, okay. The my my example is there is a, a group of people at, at the Pennsylvania Ren Fair, mm -hmm. and they they're just a loose group of friends, and they call themselves Clan McEvil, um, and they had us design a tartan for them, and we went to register it. And the Tartan Registry said, you can't call this clan Mac Evil. They are not a real clan. Therefore, you can't use the word clan unless... I think we had to put quotations around it. Okay. Um, and wow. that that got it through the That's registration process. But it's it's yeah. one of those, like, they just... Eh. It okay. is. I understand why yeah. they would say that. But it's one of those like, well, that's what they're calling themselves. So yeah, but they could lead to historical confusion if you're imagining the record being looked at a hundred years from now. Fair, fair. So I sort fair of get point. that. Um, what about changing the thread count? So you, well, you said that you basically that's your story with the with that. Okay. Yeah. So so once you have a design, make sure you're happy with it and you don't want to change it later. I yeah. guess. But after that, it's just you pay a few bucks and you're done. Yeah. And okay. keep in mind, you when you design a tartan, you don't have to have it recorded. True. Um. We did a, you know, we're a bunch of guys in the shop here are fans of the Philadelphia Flyers. So we designed a red, gray, uh, uh, orange, and black, and white tartan. No, not red. Why did I say I red? Say, why did you say and red? Orange and black and white and gray tartan. And we just, you know, jokingly called it the Broad Street Bully Tartan. Um, we didn't register it. We did a custom run of it one time for the four of us and, you know, five or six customers who wanted it as well. And that was it. That was the end of it. We didn't have it registered. We just wanted it to match our hockey jerseys. You're going to have a bunch of people ask for it now. Of course. <laughs> okay. It's my plan. All right. I, I would, hey, I, I think it'd be great if it came back. It was cool. Yeah. All right, Mac, your All turn. All right. Uh, so we have Wynn asking, um, daughters want to wear their own kilts rather than skirts or dresses. Is there anything that they should, anything specifically etiquette-wise, that they should be aware of, or is it just all personal preference when, I'm assuming when purchasing either the, the tartan that they want or even, even measurements or along those lines. I'm wondering what the context is a little bit in terms of... And the age. Yeah, and the age, when they want to wear these. Um, but yeah, it's real, for the most part, it's um, whatever you consider the bounds of good taste. You know? why, don't, why don't we have Mac poke back at her and ask yep. about the, yep. uh, that? Let's ask another question in the meantime while we're waiting on that. Sounds good. All right. We'll get back to you. Uh, Brian is asking us what the difference is between box pleats and knife pleats in terms of yardage and design and all that. I mean, how vastly different is a box pleat kilt from a knife pleat kilt? We know that knife pleat is more common, of course. Yes. So, a, I'll define the terms first for you guys. Sure. Um, a box pleated or a knife pleated kilt 
has a has all the pleats running one direction, typically starting on your left leg effectively and running around the back, pointing, if you will, towards the right hand side. Um, it's the most it's the easiest to sew. Um, when you're sewing, that is the, the bulk of the fabric is on the left hand side of the machine, so you don't have to wrap it up underneath the arm of a sewing machine. Um, the uh, a, a box pleated kilt is basically the the edge of each pleat goes both directions, so it's kind of a stripe, and then the fabric is folded in behind the pleat, and then it kind of does a Z pattern onto the next one, like an old-fashioned cheerleader skirt. Yeah. Yeah, like an old-fashioned cheerleader skirt, exactly. Yeah. Um, the box pleated kilts, typically, the pleats are going to be about an eh, inch and three quarters, two inches or so wide, um, and they're not nearly as deep. Usually, they end up about four yards of cloth, where a knife pleated kilt can be effectively as much yardage as you want. Um, well, really, either of them can be as much as you want. With a, Where it gets tricky from a kilt maker's perspective, or not tricky, as it were, a knife pleated kilt, since you're just stacking the fabric up one direction, all the, the bulk of the excess fabric all lies one direction. In a box pleated kilt, since your fabric is going both ways, inside the pleats, if the, the depth of the pleats can kind of overlap the depth of the next pleat, and it kind of gets a little bit messy on the inside or can get messy, that's why generally you use about four yards for a box pleated kilt because then there's not a lot of overlap. Hmm. In a military box pleated kilt or a rolled pleat, you know, kind of uh, where it's smaller but it's still eight yards of cloth, it's you have a whole rat's nest on the inside of fabric going back and forth, tucking in and out of itself. Um, and then for the kilt maker, it's a matter of ironing it so that all of it stays out of its own way. Hmm. It's, it's difficult okay. to explain without fabric in front of me. Gotcha. Um, but it's, yeah, it's box pleated kilts. If you're going to do one, the best, uh, for balance fabric front and back is probably a four yard box pleated kilt. I'm not a big fan of the military box. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Cool. Do we have any answers, Mac? And not yet. I'm still. Okay. okay. Got another do question? Another? Well, I was going to say it's kind of his turn. Sure. So. Um, Patrick wants to know, since someone just recently had a birthday, did they do anything fun on their birthday? I came to work at 4.30. <laughs> I worked until 6.15. I went to my son's hockey game, and or to hockey practice, then I left there early to go to my hockey game, and we won our series in the championship. We're not not the not the real winners yet. We're in the we're in the playoffs right now, but uh, we beat the first team in the first round, so that was fun. Yeah. And since since I like working, I was don't mind coming in at four thirty in the morning. There you go. Patch was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. He was he was imagining you with like a hat and you know. A little birthday crown. Yeah. yeah. Little, little like, tiara. Or Burger King. Yeah, going to yeah. Burger King. Yeah. My princess wings. Little. Yeah. Little yep. wand. Yep. Okay. Yeah. What you do in your own time is up to you. <laughs> Should I do another one? Go ahead. All right. Uh, okay. So we were talking about firstborns earlier. Michael is asking us, uh, he says he has lots of leather sporns, uh, and he just purchased uh, a firstborn. He's wondering if there are any rules or any reasons or anything he has to consider uh, about wearing it during the day. Firstborn is a day sporn. A fur covered sporn is a day sporn. Traditionally speaking, using my finger quotation marks here, um, firstborns are dress sporn. Fur meaning oval shape with the metal cantle on top are dress sporns. Um, those would be worn for formal events or after six o'clock. Um, I wouldn't wear it during the day. It looks. Uh, I kind of. I'll draw a parallel. Would you wear patent leather tuxedo shoes with your shorts down to the beach? It's, it, it's, you're not in the right context. Um, have, have I seen guys wearing firstborns, you know, dressborns out at the Celtic festival or out to the Ren Fair? Absolutely. Should they be? Probably not. Um, it's not, it's not the right context. You're mixing levels of formality, if you will. Um, so it's, for the discerning eye, it just looks off. Now, 
I understand you probably spend a lot of money on a dress porn. I understand you want to wear the dress porn because you spend a lot of money and you really, really like it and it's your new toy. I get it, I have several of them. Um, I don't have a lot of chances to wear them, but I reserve them only for formal events. I wanna, I wanna unpack it a little bit. Sure. Because you're talking more about the type of sporn in the sense of having the cantle. So you're specifically talking about a fur dress sporn. Metal right. cantle plus a fur, you know, plus a pelt. He might be talking about a, you know, a day sporn or a semi-dress sporn that has fur as an accent. In which case, what you said really doesn't really apply. <laughs> okay. Um, if in which a usual, typical advice I think would apply there that basically if it's a first born, you want to be more careful about spilling things on it, that kind of thing. Um, and then insert comments about color matching not really being an issue most of the time, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then there's also a the solid leather um, or bovine dress sporns. Would you wear a all leather dress sporn if it's only leather, if it's only dressed in the sense that it has a cantle. Yeah, it's, let me. During the day. Let me unpack a little bit of your unpacking. Please do. You have a lot of baggage. I do, um, I do. The uh, uh, one thing you said, I'm gonna correct mildly. Um, you said if it's a day sporin or a semi-dress sporin, if either of those have fur. If it's fur, it's automatically a semi-dress. Yeah, yeah okay. Day sporin Granted. is gonna be Granted. leather, period. Um, if it is a semi-dress sporin, you could wear it to a daytime event. Semi-dress sporin meaning a leather flap, sideways D shape, so that the D is facing down, leather flap with fur on the bottom half. Mm -hmm. You could wear it for daytime events, but it's a bit dressy. Um, you could wear it with a tweed and it would look nice. Um, it's a little bit dressy still, in my eye, for a casual kilt or a utility kilt or something like that. Right. If you're wearing a full leather dress sporn, um, meaning a metal cantle on the top with a full leather body, um, it's it's kind that to me is kind of akin to a semi dress where it's still fancy but leather. So it's kind of it straddles the line a little bit. Um, okay. I've kind of grown to like the leather dress borns a little bit more and more as we've done them. I like them. Um, yeah, the, but it's still, because of the metal cantle, it's still a little bit dressier. It's still, mm -hmm. it just doesn't feel quite right for the most casual. If you're wearing, okay. I'll put it this way, if you're wearing a, a tweed vest or if you're wearing, yeah, if you're wearing a tweed vest, it would look fine. But I'm trying to picture somebody wearing a t-shirt with a kilt and a leather dress board, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel right to my brain. Mm -hmm. Or a polo shirt with a, a leather or with a leather dress board. Yeah, no. It just doesn't, it's right. something is just off. Um, this gets into the question, you know, some people think that semi-dress sporns should not exist because they're neither fish nor fowl, as you would say. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that's a, a question in and of itself. I would argue that um, you could certainly wear a fancier fur sporn uh, with some metal bits on it during the day if you are doing the retro tweed look. I mean, even up until smart the 19... Smart day wear. Yeah, yeah, smart day wear, for sure. I mean, even up until the 1920s or so, you have um, metal embossed flap closure sporns with the goat hair, which is, again, it's starting to come back a little bit for people who are looking for something different and something a little more retro and a little more Downton Abbey, as you've said in the past. Um, it's not common, but that sporn is absolutely seen vintagely with tweed suits, you know? Yeah. So there is a there is kind of a middle ground, I guess. Yeah. But I told it, yeah, I mean, casual is casual. Yeah. yeah. It's so, your, when you, when you mix things, meaning very casual and formal, specifically formal, mm -hmm. it gets a little bit odd. I'll give you, I'll give you a, well, yeah. Um, I think semi-dress. You semi -dress, can play in the gray area, but. I think semi-dress, there's a lot of latitude depending on the sport. For instance, mm -hmm. if I were wearing uh, a big honkin' Aaron sweater like Adam happens to be wearing now, and I were wearing um, our Musquatch uh, semi-dress, I think that would look good for yeah. a, kind of a winter outfit because you got the, the, the bulkiness of the sweater and the bulkiness of the sport in the cap, and they both have a warm feel to them, so for a seasonal kind of a yeah. look, it might kind of be groovy, but... Um, yes, but you'd also, I could also I could see that as well yeah. with kilt hose. If you're wearing, again, back to the combat boots, if you're yeah. wearing combat boots and a t-shirt, 
that's what my mind is going to for casual, okay. then it, no. You know why you're going there? Because it's 13 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about 80 and degrees and in our studio and right and now. But, I'm but your, wish, your wishful thinking for, for <laughs> casual, casual days in August. Fair. But at least I am. Okay. Hopefully that helps. I don't know if it did. Going on your Sporn question, or Sporn topic there, uh, Zach is asking, well, what would be good Sporn for everyday farm working? Something that can be cleaned and to get dirt and grease out. Um, did Zach ask us that ahead of time? That sounds like a question I had here. Maybe. He might have. The uh, uh, good Sporn for you know, hard work, labor outside, you know, changing oil, farm working kind of thing. Um, day Sporn and make it cheap. <laughs> Um, if you're gonna wreck it, it's it's common sense kind of rules. If you're if there's a chance you're going to hurt or wreck your sporin, then either one of two things: a, be independently wealthy and get a new one, or b, learn to love the battle scars on your sporin. I mean, this is my uh, day sporin. I've had this for a few years now, um, and it's really been my go-to. And you know, the the tassels are crooked and they're sticking out, and there's you know uh, marks on it and stuff, but I've grown to love it, and it's just my daily wear sporn. Mm -hmm. So if that's how you feel about it, and you don't mind, you know, having a you know a, a blemished sporn, so to speak, then have at it. That being said, you may also want to get another day sporn that you kind of reserve for going out. Um, you have two pairs of jeans. You have your work jeans and your work boots, and you have your stepping out jeans and your stepping out you know white sneakers, whatever. Um, Cowboy boots. Yeah, cowboy boots. There you Line go. Dancing. Um, yeah, so you want to make sure that you're not. Tr there isn't going to be one thing for everything. You don't have some you know magical fairy wand waving sp sporin that poof it's you know, it's all perfect again. So relegate one for good stuff and one to get mucked up, and then don't worry about it. Yeah, I would say, um, and and Zach, it may have been you who asked this, but, or, or somebody else recently was talking about uh, a sporin and making it appropriate sporing choice for doing rugged work outside, uh, mechanic work, farm work, um, anything where you're bending over or you're going to you know, risk the, the sporing, you know, getting schmutz on it. Um, like Rocky just said, some sporins will actually kind of lend themselves to that. Like um, some of our lower end sporins, not to get product placement. I'm not trying to make a product placement, but um, my personal favorite of our lower end sporins is the Celtic Knot. It looks fine if it gets dinged up. It just looks a little bit more rugged. It has very minimal ornamentation. Yeah. Um, it's very practical because it's got magnetic clasp closure, so it's really handy for, you know, just getting in and out of. There's such a th there's room for having a practical sporin. The other thing to bear in mind is if you're working in an environment where something might happen to sporin, spin it off to the side. You can keep your sporin over on your hip or even towards your lower back on those occasions when it might be getting in your way, like working over a bench or working over a, a project or, or a car or something, just spin it around. So advantage of a sporn that you don't have with pockets. Yeah. Uh, two other things I'll point out as well. You kind of uh, got me going on one. Um, one, I wouldn't get a brown sporn if you're worried about it getting dirty. Yeah, black. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna, yeah. your dirt and, and grease stains and you know cuts are gonna show up on brown more than they will black. So I agree with Eric on the, uh, uh, the, the simpler, you know, uh, Celtic knot, pure yeah. day sporn. Um, or, and two, if you do wanna spin it to the side, um, get a sporn strap like I have on here. It's instead of using sporn chain with the little attachment in the back, you can get a sporn strap that's just basically a three quarter inch belt um, yeah. that goes around your waist and the sporn hangs from that. It'll slide easier to the side on that than it would a sporn chain. Yeah, I'd argue that could be considered more comfortable uh, for a work environment also. Yeah, actually, potentially. Um, I've been known to uh, actually, like uh, a knife with a clip on the side, sometimes put on uh, the strap part of my sporn chain or on a sporn strap. So you've got a little extra belt to hang stuff off of, like your keychain, yeah. carabiners, all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, play around with it. Like yeah. I always say, experiment with it and hack it. And But uh, yeah, a, uh, a, a Rob Roy, like a bag sporn, that style is also looks fine if it gets dinged up. It just looks more rugged. So, yep. yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do about two more. We gotta get going. We have to cut it a little bit short today. So give one from you and one from Mac. Mac, you wanna go first? Yeah, a win did get back to him. Okay. Back to us. So uh, the he said the daughters range from fourteen to five. And okay. it would be it would not be every day, but occasional wear. Okay. Okay. If you're gonna fourteen to five, um, <clears throat> yes they can wear 
men's kilts. You know, women will do what women want to do with fashion. There, there's a lot less rules for women's fashion than there is for men's. Um, what I would say is, um, A, you're in a good position having a range of ages because they're going to be hand-me-downs. They will right. outgrow the kilt lengthwise before they do height-wise, or excuse me, waist-wise. Um, so if you, for the younger one, you may want to consider getting a kilted skirt or something a little bit below the knee. That way they can kind of, as they shoot up like a weed, um, that will, you know, grow into the kilt as it were, or it still won't look obscenely short, if you will. Um, and then same thing for the older girls. If you get a little bit longer, it'll be able to fit them for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. But there's no convention that, you know, they have to get a kilted skirt or they have to get a mini kilt or, you know, they must wear a man's kilt or something. Right. Um, tartan wise, if you have a tartan and your, or if your husband has a tartan, they can wear either of those. Um, there's no, you know, must wear this or must wear that. Traditionally speaking, the tartan is effectively passed down through the father's side of the family, but there's nothing saying you can't wear your mom's tartan. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, disrespectful. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they could they could wear a fashion tartan or universal tartan. Um, obviously, obviously, for that age range, we will often recommend polyviscose because of the washability and the durability and the, and the cost because, yeah, they're not going to have it for their whole lives the way an adult buying a kilt will. Um, in terms of the, the rest of the outfit, I don't know if that's a concern. Um, just keep it simple. You know, a traditional kilted skirt and white blouse, that's the, uh, the more formal-ish to daywear look for women. So a white top, uh, or nothing too frilly, or black, yeah. basically just, you know, I would not have the 14-year-old wearing, you know, pink neon uh, unicorn jumping over a rainbow kind of kind of thing. My daughter would. Chris but, Gulick would. Yeah, Chris Gulick would, but yeah. he's not 14 either. He can make his own decisions. Um, you know, just keep the top simple so that the attention goes to the skirt the way you want it to. Yep. So. Agreed. Yeah. Hopefully that helped. You want me to do one more? Sure. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to find a good one here. All right. This is an interesting one. Brent is saying, I have recently heard about the military putting elastic into the pleats of their kilts. Do you see any problems with this? Problems this could cause or any benefits such as sitting down and getting in and out of a car? I mean, what about elasticizing pleats in a kilt? Who does that and why? <clears throat> There's, um, it is a military thing. It's not done all the time, but it can be done. Um, it kind of helps the pleats stay kind of in place on a parade march. Um, basically, what he's talking about is on the inside of the kilt. You can put um, a loosely sewn piece of elastic um, about, you know, effectively from the first pleat along the back to the last pleat. They put them about five, six inches below the bottom of the, the sewn in lining, which is about halfway down the whole length of the kilt. Um, that way, watching on parade, their pleats don't go too far astray. You don't want to put the elastic too far down because if you do, when you start marching, the the back of the the back of the kilt kind of tucks in underneath your legs. Hmm. Um, I've I've seen it. It's not something that I think, in my estimation, would matter all that much. Um, it might add a little bit of convenience, but. I don't know. I don't think it's worth all the yeah. effort. Um, and it it's basically restricting some of the movement of the pleats. So if you want your pleat movement restricted for one reason or another, sure, it kind of makes sense. Um, and it's not sewn to every single pleat, but like every like third or fifth one. Um, so it's done. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. I think it's entirely a parade yeah. thing. Just like you know, just like having extra closure systems and and snaps and 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 hidden Velcro and all kinds of stuff, and just to make sure that you look absolutely perfectly crisp, you know, in that context. Yeah. I can't. I mean, Matt can attest to this. I mean, kilts that were worn in combat, uh, daily wear kind of military kilts wouldn't really have that. I don't think yeah. did they? Yeah. No, he's shaking his head. You know. So it's a, uh, yeah. So it's really just a it's it's a photo op thing. Yeah. Really. Yeah. What they found was the soldiers 
were spinning around too often and exposing themselves, <laughs> so they refused to allow that to happen. Right. So they put the elastic in there. Right. Okay, maybe I made that up. I think you might have made that up. Yes. <laughs> Somebody's gonna find evidence to the contrary. Oh jeez. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna like oh actually at the Battle of Hastings, you know, <laughs> which would be interesting. <laughs> All right, it's fourth. Let's do one more. You want to do one more? Yeah. Mac, I don't have, do you have a lot of people waiting yeah. in the wings? Oh, uh, we've got a few here. I just want to be fair to people. We do need to cut short a little bit today, but... Uh, just trying to see, look Pick the best one, one Mac. Yeah. I'm no pressure. To... I want this to be the best question ever asked on the show. <laughs> Are you ready? And go. All right, let's go with... Um, well, let's go back to your, to your tartan designer. Here okay. we go. Or no, let's go to this one. Oh. Scott Sanders. Is a light blue tan more traditional in color than any other color um, for headwear? Meaning yeah. I meaning like a blue bonnet. Yeah. Sure. It is, actually. Um, I cannot attest to how old uh, the blue bonnet is. I do know that it certainly goes back to the 18th century. Um, and it was absolutely... Um, the emblem of the Jacobites with the, especially, you know, with the, the crossed white ribbons to form the saltire. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for something traditional, ultra traditional, I would definitely go with the, the blue. Um, I would, I'm willing to bet that, uh, it was the blue dye may have become popular in that time period, probably could for some convenience factor. It often is the case with dyes. Um, like there was a woad or an indigo source that was common and it became a fashion item and also a convenience for who, were, who was making hats uh, sometime in the 17th or 18th century and just became traditional after that. You know, like said, so like, well, we've always made them blue, so they're going to be blue. Um, do you have evidence to the contrary from a military standpoint by any chance? At least not from, well, from my point, it's everything's all uh, khaki at that point. Well, yeah, so, you're much, yeah, you're much later. So yeah. anything but parade was still, even the Glengarry's for the 42nd mm -hmm. were... Uh, at least for the band, we're, we're Navy, so it, okay. you can still have that, but for most everything that I've done, it, in my research, it's all khaki. Okay. Yeah, but so I think, I think um, how traditional do you want to be? I mean, if you want to be traditional in a modern context, then there's a number of colors that would be fine, and I think you tend to see the khaki or, um, or black is more common in the 20th century, but, uh, but the, the sky blue, that's ancient. That's really I was going to say, it, to me, that goes beyond traditional to historical. Historical. Yeah. 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 So, All right. Yeah. Cool. Let's do one more off the list. Eric. Sure. Okay. Your best ever question. Oh, I don't know. It's hard to beat the uh, hard to beat the, uh, the, the funky, horrible tartan question. Um, all right. Here's a practical one. Um, we, have, we have lots of qu customers who are bigger guys. Um, this gentleman was asking... Um, Let's say you're wearing a vest or a formal jacket. Would it be acceptable to use an inch and a half belt so that you could carry the sporin on sporin hangers? He's ha he has a belly, so he's trying to make it yeah, more yeah, comfortable yeah. for that. Um, he knows about using the tricks of like hanging the sporin chain in different ways, like over the kilt buckles, that kind of thing. But he prefers the hangers. Um, he also likes the ability to have a belt that he can slide other things like his cell phone holster around. So he can have like his phone hidden in the back um, but have the hangers because he finds that more comfortable. So how would you parse that out for formal wear? He's wearing a vest? I believe so. He's saying a vest or a formal jacket. The, a, a, an inch and a half belt with, with a vest. I'll, let me, I'll take it two different ways. I'll do with a vest and without a vest. Um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of it for either. Um, the inch and a half belt with a vest if you can tuck the belt up underneath the vest entirely so you don't see it and you're wearing it tight enough um, that it's not going to, you know, peak down over time and it's going to be able to hold the weight of the sporin, then okay. Um, but I'd get a pair of sporin hangers that are uh, either longer or add some chain to the end of it so that the sporin can hang down to the appropriate height, um, but okay. the tops are still in the... The belt is actually still hidden underneath the top of the vest or underneath the bottom of the vest. Um, that being said, you wouldn't really be able to wear a belt pouch with it, or your or your phone charger or your phone 
holster with it yeah. because it would you know cause a big lump on the side of your vest or the vest wouldn't fit right so that kind of defeats that purpose if you're wearing it without a vest just the jacket um you could wear a uh, holster on it or your uh, uh your phone holster on it however it's gonna look weird i mean you're having a your kilt is worn up around the widest part of you and a kilt belt is two and a quarter inches wide with a you know a big old belt buckle that looks proportionate to the kilt and to your body and all the rest of it when you wear a skinny belt whether it's one inch or even an inch and a half like jean style belt up that high it on a kilt it just doesn't look quite right mm -hmm. um no matter whether you know, that's why i'm saying if it's hidden maybe but yeah i i wouldn't do it i'd still do the trick of hanging your uh, your sporn chain or your sporn strap over top of the buckles on the side of your kilt before I would do a, a belt like that. I suspect he's still having the problem even with using the, the, the chain on the buckle trick um, that his sporn is undercutting his belly and he doesn't like how that's looking. One thing that so I, this, this I saw a long time ago um, uh, on a couple kilts from Scotland, um, when there is at least one maker who does it, because I remember seeing it. Um, when kilt waists were bigger, they actually put two, you know, the, the two little uh, loops that you, you know sometimes have on the inside of your kilt to hang the kilt up? Yeah. Um, they did something like that. Think of like belt loops made of tartan, and they sewed it to the front of the kilt up near the top. Okay. And they actually ran the sporin chain through there, so, so it would it's hang coming, down. So it's coming across and then down. Correct through those like so so correct so perhaps installing some extra belt loops so the chain you're wearing the sworn chain more like a belt then that comes around to a, a strategic strategic point to these two loops and then yeah but they weren't belt loops yeah. they were they were they were belt loops think of like you know a belt loop a long skinny piece of fabric yeah fold it in half so it makes a, a U kind of shape and they sewed it to the inside of the kilt oh, to oh, the inside oh. of the front apron. Huh. And then they, if you want to use it, you flip it over top of the front apron so you can have it on wow. the front of the kilt. And they would That's sew them about, you know, 10 inches, 12 inches apart on either side of the front gig line, okay. the, the centered line on the front so apron. So it's a little bit, it's more like, yeah, no, I, I don't. And then that way you work. run your chain around your waist and then through those loops and then it hangs down right there in the okay. front versus... Um, on the sides, like I'm suggesting, hooking it over top of the buckles. But even hooking over top of the buckles, you're still getting more of an angle like this. As I said, this it's like yes, down. Correct. You're it goes really making a sharp... along the top, and then it's a sharp angle down, That's similar wild. to how sporn hangers would be. Um, so you're making fabric sporn hangers in a way. Yes. What well, sort of kind? Of, I don't know. That's fabric belt loops that are hideable. Fascinating. Fascinating. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I was never a big fan of it because it could kind of pull at the the top of the front of the kilt. I would think it would cause the the it to roll. Yeah. Over time, it would. Yeah. It, you know, especially with body heat and everything. I would think it would cause the top the top of your apron to start to roll. Yeah. Or you can wear the, you know you could sew the same thing to the front apron like and tuck it underneath the uh, underneath the waistband so that you only have you know an inch or so hanging down mm -hmm. just enough to get the chain through. The mm -hmm. problem is if you're not wearing your spore in that way, then you're left with those little tabs yeah. for lack of a better term. Now, do you? Do you still think that system would look okay without the vest on? Or would it look Which? weird because the, the the original that you saw in Scotland, like the chain coming across and then going through the loop and coming down, would that look weird? If you, it, Or would you prefer to have it covered by a waistcoat? I, th I would prefer to have it covered by a waistcoat. I think that's yeah. kind of what they were assuming anyway. Probably. Um, probably. If, the, if it's done in Scotland and it was the traditional kilt maker that I saw, then there was, they're yeah. probably assuming that the person's yeah. wearing it for formal functions so right. that they would have a vest on. Right. So that okay. makes sense. Um, in a casual setting, mm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, it may look kind of odd. Okay. Um, I, this is not the answer that this gentleman would necessarily want to hear, but I will point out that you don't have to wear a sporn. It can look a little strange to some people's eyes, but you don't, okay. But you don't, you do not have to wear a sporn. If the sporn is really that much of a problem, maybe, maybe you skip the sporn and carry your gear in your jacket pocket or something. I, it's mm -hmm. if he's wearing it Which with a better. formal outfit. You should probably have a sport. I agree. Yeah, I think I it, it would look. Seen, yeah. It's now if I'm in the shop and I'm running around yeah. and I don't, ha I'd leave my sport in my office. I'll agree with that. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing something, 
you know, out in the public or something formal, it would look like you forgot it to me. It would look like okay. you you got okay. dressed and you got there and you're like, oh shoot, I forgot to wear my sporin. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And it you wouldn't look completely, the outfit wouldn't look complete. Does the weight of a sporin affect how it's gonna hang on a larger person? Would a lighter weight sporin, like for instance, if a person's having problems like this, would you recommend a semi-dress over a full dress sporin? Um, would that be another way to help the situation? To a degree, yes. Um, it would, and it also how high you're wearing it. Okay. If he's that was another question we had was how high do you wear a sporn? Yeah. Actually. If he's especially on a guy, if you're if you're a guy with a a big belly that sticks out in front and it comes in a little bit on the bottom, um, if you wear your sporn a little bit lower, what ends up happening is it kind of tilts back in. Mm -hmm. um, just c especially if you have a lot of weight on it, you're, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of weight in it. Um, yeah. So wearing your sporin a little bit higher, it'll sit a little bit flatter on the front of you. You wanna wear it, you know, so that it's the center mass of the sporin is above the, the cliff <laughs> where your belly comes back in. Um, that'll hang down a little bit straighter. If you wear okay. it below that, it's gonna tuck in and dishevel the front of the kill. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Very All right. good. All right, boys and girls. Thank you for watching. Um, Much appreciated. Do we have anything coming up we need to announce? Uh, don't forget that we will have the next episode of our new show, uh, Exploring Perspectives, coming up on, I believe, the 18th. Does that sound right? The third no. Friday. Yeah, the third, fri third Friday of the month is what we're aiming for, basically. Um, that is uh, natively broadcast on that other media platform that begins with a Y. YouTube! And uh, um, so you're all invited to join us there. Uh, that's going to become a regular thing, and uh, do, you, do you want to discuss what the topic is, or do you want to keep that a secret? Um, what is the topic? We'll discuss it. The topic is well, going man. to be, um, is there such a thing as taboo or forbidden tartans, and how do you navigate situations where someone might be calling you on bad tartan etiquette? That is, sounds like an interesting topic. Thing. It does. I can't wait to see what we come up I, with. Me too, because I don't... I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm going to tune in too. Wait, I have to be on the camera, so I can't tune in. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Um, what the, the basic format for that show is, guys, um, Eric and I kind of come up with a topic. We just kind of unpack a bunch of different questions about it. We're trying to stay neutral and give less opinions. So far, that hasn't worked out. Um, <laughs> so basically... We'll take some interaction from the audience, have you guys kind of um, uh, add to the discussion. It's not really right. a question and answer format. It's more right. of just an exploring of the topic of different aspects, playing devil's advocate, all kinds of different things. Yeah. And it's our job to kind of lay things out on the table and let you guys decide where you land on a particular yeah, issue. Yeah, provide, provide some moderated opinion, but, uh, but mainly try to give as much facts as possible about the topic so that you guys can discuss it among yourselves and, as we always say, make the best decision for your own context. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, anyway, keep an eye out for that. Third um, Friday. Yep, third Friday of the month. We're going to be doing uh, that on YouTube. We're going to be trying to put some more stuff on YouTube, but we're also going to announce it on Facebook as well so yep. you guys won't miss it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then next month we're going to do the Q&A show probably on the, I believe it's the 3rd of March, uh, basically the first Monday of the month um, because I'm going to be away on that Friday. So, that being said, until next time, guys. Slanjava.